An Orange County, California lawyer lost an already won malpractice verdict after his boasting on Instagram became new evidence in the plaintiff's motion for a new trial. That's right, Robert McKenna III appeared in an online celebration video bragging about his firm's work on the case and admitting that a guy was probably negligently killed, but kind of made it look like other people did it. Hi, I'm Leonard French. This is my show, Lawful Masses, with Leonard French, where I go over law stuff. It's usually copyright, but sometimes, sometimes, you just can't drive past a wreck without staring, and this is one of those cases. So let's dive in, starting with the plaintiff's motion for a new trial. The plaintiffs hereby request a new trial based on the following facts and occurrences which, individually and in the aggregate, warrant a new trial. This is a medical malpractice action brought by the plaintiffs Johanna Garcia, Catherine Garcia, and the estate of Enrique Garcia Sanchez. Plaintiffs allege that defendant Assam R. Qureshi, Qureshi, MD, medical doctor, was negligent in his care and treatment of Enrique. Specifically, plaintiffs claim that Dr. Qureshi was negligent in placing a feeding tube into the abdomen of decedent, which ruptured organs resulting in infection and sepsis, from which he ultimately passed away. Conversely, defendant Assam R. Qureshi, MD, denied any negligence and maintains that he complied with the standard of care in their treatment of decedent. Specifically, defendant argued that Dr. Qureshi was one of several physicians providing care to the defendant and that his role in that care was minimal. Defendant disputed that there were alternative actions Dr. Qureshi could have taken to prevent decedent's death. That last defense is going to be called the empty chair defense, which was part of the defense's strategy. In defendant's closing arguments, Mr. McKenna argued that the only person the plaintiffs brought into this courtroom to make an accusation against was the defendant. With all the doctors giving care to the decedent, plaintiffs picked only this particular doctor, defense argued. This argument amounts to an empty chair argument. Without saying someone else specifically is at fault, the defendant gets to point out that there is probably someone else out there who's responsible, it's just not the defendant. Defendant made a similar argument in his mini opening at voir dire. There were other arguments in plaintiff's motion, such as the language defense counsel used during closing arguments that plaintiff's case was the most, quote, insulting, factually devoid presentation he had ever seen, and that the case was nothing less than extortion. At one point, Mr. McKenna allegedly shouted, Welcome to America! across the courtroom, apparently in an attempt to sway the jury. But then there was the Instagram video. At some point, shortly after the conclusion of the trial, a video was posted on the Instagram page for the defense counsel's law firm. Plaintiff's counsel was notified of the video's existence by a colleague, and they acted quickly to preserve the video. In this video, counsel for defense Robert McKenna is standing at a podium with a laptop in front of him, and he appears to be giving a presentation to other members of his office about recent trials, one of which is the instant trial. He makes the following statements about this trial. Um, a guy that was probably negligently killed, but we kind of made it look like other people did it, and we actually had a death certificate that said he died the very way the plaintiff said he did. And we had to say, no, you shouldn't believe what the death certificate says, or the coroner from the Orange County Coroner's Office who says it says what it says, and that it's right. Overcoming all of those hurdles, we managed to sock three lawyers in the face. And it was the fastest defense verdict Esther has ever gotten. And it's the fastest defense verdict I've ever gotten. And it was a 12 to 0 defense verdict in 26 minutes. So here, here, Esther, go ahead, ring the bell. Dear viewers, to bring you the proper context for these comments, you should see the video of Attorney McKenna's comments for yourself. But uh, we kind of made it look like other people did it. And we actually had a death certificate that said he died the very way the plaintiff said he died, and we had to say, no, you really shouldn't believe what that death certificate says, or the coroner from the Orange County Coroner's Office who says it says what it says, and that it's right. Overcoming all of those hurdles, uh, we managed to sock three lawyers in the face and uh, it was it was the fastest defense verdict esther's ever gotten 
and it's the fastest defense verdict I've ever gotten, and it was a 12-0 defense verdict in 26 minutes. So, here, here, Esther, go ahead and ring the bell. They literally have a victory bell. At his instructions, a woman runs to ring a bell while the rest of the office claps. Mr. McKenna appears to be saying that he knows his client was negligent, but that he and his team were able to trick the jury into believing something that was not true. He specifically uses the phrase, probably negligently killed, about the plaintiff and, we made it look like other people did it. Additionally, there was counsel for defendant Esther Kim ringing a victory bell about a case involving someone who died, and it felt insensitive, unprofessional, and in poor taste to be celebrating a victory over that. This was not just celebrating a win for his team. Mr. McKenna was gloating and disparaging plaintiff's counsel and his colleagues. His phrase of, we managed to sock three lawyers in the face, felt unnecessarily cruel and gleefully hateful. There is a difference here between the tone of the video and the tone Mr. McKenna struck during his closing argument. Both statements were full of strong language and heated passion, but at trial, that passion fueled comments about searching for truth and justice and giving the defendant doctor a chance to have his day in court. Mr. McKenna took a hard line, and he was not kind to plaintiffs or plaintiffs' counsel, but at least he framed his commentary as advocating for his client. This video does not follow that line. In it, he is gloating and bragging, and he does not once mention justice or righteousness or a search for truth. Instead, it implies that the truth does not matter. Only winning matters. Getting to ring that victory bell matters. Socking lawyers in the face matters. Even if you have to make it look like someone else did it at the expense of the truth. Though it was quickly removed from Instagram, the video went viral. It was shared and forwarded across the Southern California legal community and beyond. Multiple news outlets picked it up, and there were articles about it, including one written by the LA Times and another written by the ABA Journal. These articles include reference to the video, quotes from it, and even stills from the video. They note that the video was removed from Instagram shortly after it was posted, but it was too late to stop the tide of public opinion about Mr. McKenna's comments. The articles indicate that the video now exists online as a posting to the Twitter account of Torthub. Now, there's nothing wrong with celebrating a victory, and that's not what the legal community is outraged about here. What crossed the line in Mr. McKenna's bragging was the revelation of the defense's questionable trial tactics, a revelation that potentially crosses the line into disclosing client confidential information, but definitely crosses the line of don't tell your opponent you knew you were culpable all along. It reveals morally unethical behavior that borders on professionally unethical behavior and, and could be a lot more than that depending upon how the California bar treats these things. However that goes is between him and his client and the bar. Next came the apology video. Mr. McKenna later recorded and posted another video as an apparent apology for the comments he made in the viral video. This video appeared on the defense firm's Instagram stories and existed only for a short time, approximately 24 hours, but it also was downloaded and preserved by counsel for plaintiffs. In this apology video, Mr. McKenna acknowledges that the first video is him speaking and that he made the statements in that video. He even quotes some of the things he said in the viral video. Among other things, he claims that he did not know that the remarks he made that day were being videotaped, nor did he know that a snippet of those comments would be posted online. He asserts that his comments in the video were taken out of context and acknowledges that his comments in the video communicate that something was done wrong, that my client was negligent, or that I did something inappropriate or unprofessional during the course of this trial. This is regret that he got caught, not that he made the comments in the first place. In their own homes and small office settings, people feel comfortable and are more likely to reveal themselves at their inner core. Making closing arguments to a jury at trial is much different than what is said once everyone goes back to the office. In the apology video, Mr. McKenna says that, When I said that this man likely died of negligent killing, but we made it look like somebody else was responsible, that was not my opinion. That was the opinion of the experts who had reviewed all the materials and testified in the case. This appears to be an acknowledgement and admission that defendant's intention and goal was to point to an empty chair. At no point does Mr. McKenna state which experts had that opinion, and it is unclear from a review of the record which experts made such an assertion. The apology is not an actual apology. It deflects responsibility and states that the comments were taken out of context, and therefore it only seems like he did something wrong. 
He does not give any context other than to say that the broader discussion involved cases we handled over the past two years, wins and losses during the course of the global pandemic, and how the jury system seemed to be doing during that time. This statement does not give context to help understand statements like the plaintiff was probably negligently killed, but we kind of made it look like other people did it, nor does it give context or help statements like we managed to sock three lawyers in the face. Mr. McKenna stated, to be clear, I want to apologize to my client and the medical community as a whole for making comments that, when taken out of context, would suggest that something was done wrong, that my client was negligent, or that I did something inappropriate or unprofessional during the course of this trial. Ultimately, this is an I'm sorry I got caught apology, not an I'm sorry apology. So on those facts, plaintiff requested a new trial. Plaintiff respectfully requests an order granting a new trial. Courts have no inherent power to grant a new trial. Instead, the right to a new trial is purely statutory, and a motion for a new trial can be granted only on one of the grounds enumerated in the statute. It is in rare instances, and on very strong grounds, that a reviewing court will set aside an order granting a new trial. A motion for a new trial may be granted if there is an irregularity in the proceedings of the court, jury, or adverse party, or any order of the court, or abuse of discretion by which a party was prevented from having a fair trial. An irregularity is any overt act of the trial court, the jury, or an adverse party that violates the right to a fair and impartial trial and amounts to misconduct. The irregularity must materially affect the substantial rights of a party, so not just any irregularity. When misconduct by the attorney for an adverse party is alleged as grounds for a new trial, prejudicial error is committed only when the attorney's conduct consists of a willful or persistent effort to place before a jury clearly incompetent evidence, or the statements or remarks of counsel are of such a character as to manifest a design on his or her part to arouse the jury's resentment or prejudices or passions against the moving party or to enlist the jury's sympathy in favor of his or her client and against the moving party. And any jury instructions to disregard such offered evidence or objectionable remarks cannot be deemed to have cured the evil or ill effect. In assessing that prejudice, each case ultimately must rest on the court's view of the overall record, taking into account such factors, among others, as the nature and seriousness of the remarks and misconduct, the general atmosphere, including the judge's control of the trial, the likelihood of prejudicing the jury, and the efficacy of objection or admonition under all the circumstances. The defense counsel's misconduct during trial comes from two different places. One, his remarks in violation of his promise not to bring the empty chair argument, and two, his inflammatory and highly prejudicial closing statement. Okay, so remember that the viral video wasn't the only grounds for a new trial. Here is where the plaintiffs point to all the times that McKenna allegedly referred to the many doctors the plaintiff had caring for them, implying that it must have been one of them to the jury improperly. Then we get to the argument about the viral video. Under California law, a motion for a new trial may be granted on the grounds of newly discovered evidence, material for the party making the application that he or she could not, with reasonable diligence, have discovered and produced at trial, Newly discovered evidence must be evidence that existed at the time of the trial or hearing on the dispositive motion. All of the following elements must be established. The evidence is not merely material, but also newly discovered. It is not merely cumulative. It is such to render a different result probable on retrial. The party could not with reasonable diligence have discovered and produced it earlier and the facts are shown by the best evidence of which the case admits. In other words, if you have a video, you watch the video, not somebody's summary of the video. Here, it would be easy to argue that the viral video and apology video are not evidence which existed at the time of trial. After all, the videos did not exist until after the trial. <laughs> the fact is, however, the true personality, ethics, and morals of defense counsel were hidden at the time of trial, his bad faith intentions existed at the time of trial, and bits and pieces were evident in his closing arguments, but this admission of trickery, sneaky behavior, and bias against plaintiffs really became evident only after trial. The evidence was there at trial, but not the full extent of it. That does not, however, mean that this newly discovered evidence is cumulative. It is new evidence of his intentions and character that was not evident at trial, and which could not have been discovered until after the trial when he felt comfortable enough to let it out. This is evidence of a different bent 
than the biases and comments at closing arguments meant to inflame the passions of the jury. Without a defense counsel intent on making things look like something else happened, in spite of the fact that the decedent was probably negligently killed, and the death certificate and coroner's report support the plaintiff's theory of liability, a different result at trial is probable. Neither plaintiffs nor defendants could have discovered this evidence prior to the time of trial because by its very nature this evidence is the type that normally stays hidden, but it is the most dangerous. Finally, there is no better evidence of a person's mindset than their very own words and admissions. In addition, the trial court may consider the credibility as well as the materiality of evidence in its determination of whether introduction of the evidence in a new trial would render a different result reasonably probable. This evidence is highly credible. It is obviously Mr. McKenna in both videos, and the second video authenticates the first video. And based on that, the plaintiff asks for a new trial. Now, before the judge grants or denies the request for a new trial, the opposing party gets a chance to argue against it. So in that opposition, the defense addressed the video in a two-paragraph section, claiming that the video was taken out of context and that it was meant to be private. Several weeks after the verdict was returned, defense counsel made private remarks inside his firm which were, unbeknownst to him, recorded and posted on social media. On May 13, 2022, after the conclusion of the trial and the jury's verdict, counsel for defendant Robert McKenna was participating in a closed-door inter-office meeting where both his Los Angeles office and his Huntington Beach office were connected via Zoom. One of the purposes of the meeting was to summarize recent cases that had been brought to completion and celebrate certain victories over the past two years of the pandemic. During that meeting, Mr. McKenna briefly described a case without naming any party's counsel or venue. The description was hyperbolic and meant to recognize the work other lawyers put into the case. It was not intended to be, nor was it, an objective, comprehensive, or even accurate recitation of this case. Mr. McKenna was unaware he was being taped or that it would be put on social media. When it came to Mr. McKenna's attention that a video had been taken, posted, and reposted, he recorded an apology video and posted it to the firm's Instagram account and LinkedIn profile. Specifically, without identifying any parties, lawyers, or venue, he apologized for any appearance of impropriety that was caused by the unauthorized taping and dissemination of the remarks. They also argue that the video should be excluded from evidence and a new trial should not be granted. They say the evidence is not material. The newly discovered evidence must be material in the sense that it is likely to produce a different result. It must be specific, and if it is not, a new trial cannot be granted. Here, it is not material. First, attorney statements are not evidence, and the statements are not probative of any question of fact at issue in the case. Second, Plaintiff argues that the evidence pertains to bad faith of defense counsel, but that was not at issue in the trial, nor do the videos establish bad faith conduct. What defense counsel thought about the case is not the proper subject for pre-trial discovery. To the extent plaintiffs are arguing evidence of the cause of death is newly discovered, there was ample opportunity for plaintiff to take that discovery. Even if the video evidence were material, it was not newly discovered. Evidence is not newly discovered merely if it was not discovered with reasonable diligence. The evidence cannot be considered new if, with reasonable diligence, it might have been known. Wait a second, how are you supposed to know about a video that wasn't created yet? So, you're in discovery in the litigation. This video was created after the litigation, so that argument doesn't hold water. The motion for a new trial will be denied where the evidence might have been produced by the exercise of reasonable diligence or where the moving party has not shown due diligence in discovering and producing it or where no reason is shown why the evidence might not with reasonable diligence have been discovered and produced. This is the weakest argument I've ever seen. In fact, a motion for a new trial will be denied where the evidence might have been produced by the exercise of reasonable diligence. Wait, isn't, isn't that the same thing? Yes, this is the same paragraph, just with a, a cite to a different case. You could have just included the, the two cites or whatever. Evidence of Dr. Weiler's conduct as the cause of decedent's death, whether or not negligent, could have been discovered before trial by the exercise of due diligence. Whether or not the plaintiffs should have been more diligent seems like the kind of deflection you use when you are the one being accused of a lack of vigilance in policing your own behavior. But I guess those are different words. Either way, the judge did not agree with him. In this notice of ruling, the plaintiff's attorney tells us all what happened at the hearing on the motion for the new trial. Please take notice that on August 4th, 2022 at 10 a.m., 
plaintiffs Johanna Garcia, Catherine Vanessa Garcia, and the estate of Enrique Garcia Sanchez's motion for a new trial came before the court. After hearing argument from counsel, the court granted plaintiff's motion for a new trial on the following grounds. 1. An irregularity in the proceedings of the court materially affected the substantial rights of the plaintiff and prevented a fair trial. To wit, defense counsel's inflammatory closing argument where he told the jury that plaintiffs and plaintiff's counsel had extorted the defendant violated the plaintiff's right to a fair and impartial trial. Second, defense counsel's closing argument was improper in that he inserted his personal opinion by saying, Welcome to America. Welcome to the personal injury industrial complex. This statement could be interpreted as being anti-immigrant. Three, the 19 calendar days break mid-trial allowed by the trial court was an irregularity in the proceedings which violated the plaintiff's right to a fair and improper trial. Okay, so there was a 19 calendar day break in the middle of the trial. That's not good. Four, defense counsel's empty chair arguments during closing arguments made after he promised the court that he would not do so violated plaintiff's right to a fair and impartial trial. And last, the jury four persons fair to disclose during voir dire that his previous employment as an agent for Farmers Insurance Company violated plaintiff's right to a fair and impartial trial. Then, newly discovered evidence, material for the party making the application, which he could not with reasonable diligence have discovered and produced at trial. To wit, videos posted by defense counsel on social media in which he commented that plaintiff was probably negligently killed by defendant and he made it seem like other people had done it, amounts to an admission that justice had not prevailed and that an irregularity in the proceedings occurred during the trial that materially affected the substantial rights of the plaintiffs and prevented a fair trial. The court ordered plaintiff's counsel to prepare the notice of ruling. The court further set a case management conference for October 26, 2022 at 9 a.m. of the above titled court. So there you have it, my lawful masses, a list of things not to do when you are a lawyer who has already won a jury verdict in your medical malpractice case. Don't make inflammatory comments during closing argument. Don't make the empty chair arguments that you promise not to make. And don't make a video of how this was such a remarkable win because you should never have won because your client is probably negligent and liable for the medical malpractice that you were hired to defend. So do with that what you will. I hope you enjoyed this story. I couldn't bring you these stories if it weren't for my supporters. I don't take sponsorships. This channel is entirely brought to you by the community support of my patrons, sponsors, supporters, and YouTube Floatplane and Twitch members. In the month of August, thank you to John Steele, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hytov, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Good Broge, Pure Magma, Eric Tams, Tech Tech Potato, The Blood Soaked Survivors, Wyatt Calandro, King Ares, and Kyle Seafrank. Please consider supporting if you want to see more of what I do. Until next time, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Love you all. Bye.